with my family. Super stoked to be back for the holidays. And just a couple things here before we get going on the questions. First and foremost, if you guys have a specific question and you want to make sure that I see it, do a super chat. And we've got Sebastian on the line right now. And if you do a super chat, he will text that question to me and I'll answer it ASAP. Number two is if you guys want to book an hour to ask me specific questions, I've done a few of those and they've gone really, really well. I've got some really neat people that uh, are in the community. But we talk about investing or entrepreneurship questions, uh, diversifying overseas. Uh, if you guys want to know how to make money with old Ford pickups, <laughs> anything like that, you can email Sebastian at admin at georgegammon.com and he'll go ahead and set up a, a specific time slot. I'm not going to be doing anything until probably Friday just so I can spend time with my family for the holidays. But uh, let's go and dive right in. Try to go to the, we'll do it that same way where I just ask, ask the questions that are pulling up just right in the stream. See, oh, and make sure guys, when you ask a question, put question in capital letters before you do the comment and then I'll see it right away. Uh, so Johnny asks, how is crime in Colombia? Is it good for retirement? The crime is almost non-existent. It's just as safe, if not safer, than any city that you'd go to in the United States, especially some of the bigger cities. It's gonna be way safer than like a Chicago or a Washington DC, anything like that. And then let's see, what was the rest? Oh, as far as retirement, it's fantastic. The cost of living is incredibly cheap. The weather's amazing. They call it the Valley, at least where I am in Medellin, they call it the Valley of Eternal Spring because you've got this really, interesting dynamic where you're right on the equator but you're at a high enough elevation to where the weather never changes it's 80 degrees every day 70 65 at night it's uh and then if you're down there especially if you're a retiree and you're on a, a fixed income if you're making two or three thousand dollars usd a month down there you're gonna live like a king so it's a fantastic place to retire Okay, let me see if we got any. Okay, I got Sebastian's feed pulled up here. Okay, Theodore asks, silver is much more of an industrial metal than gold. Yes. Does this limit how high silver's price can go since it's needed in so many essential industrial products? Actually, I think it's the reverse. Generally, if you look at when gold goes into a big bull market, silver will go up even further. So it's almost like a leveraged way to play gold. Um, right now, I'm looking at the two in a little bit different light. I'm looking at gold as an insurance policy and silver as more of a speculation. But obviously, I like them both. Okay, Narada, oh, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Narada just says Merry Christmas uh, with a super chat. Merry Christmas to you and Merry Christmas to everyone else. I hope you're, you guys are all able to spend some time with your family. I know I'm really looking forward to it. I'm here at my sister's house in Dallas. I got my mom coming in tomorrow, so it's gonna be gonna be awesome. Okay, next question. Ufda asks, as an average Joe with a solid job, some credit card debt, how will this recession really hammer me? <laughs> um, it really depends if we go into a stagflation. That, that's probably my base case, but it, who knows? You could go into deflation. You could go into... I don't think we'll get real growth anytime soon, unfortunately. But uh, 
you're looking at the unemployment rate going up. So that's why I always suggest that people invest in themselves, invest in your own education, learn a skill. If you've got something that you can produce things that other people can't produce, there's always going to be demand for that. And you'll always do well. As far as your credit card debt, yeah, you really want to try to get that down as soon as you can because that's on a, a variable rate. So that interest rate could go through the roof if we get some inflation. And I know the interest rates on credit cards right now are very close to an all time high, although interest rates are extremely low. So any type of credit card debt is not good. That's not to say all debt is bad. If you go into a 30 year, a 30 year fixed rate mortgage, that's good debt, but that's debt that's working for you because you're controlling a cash flowing asset. Consumer debt, you don't want any part of that especially when it's an adjustable rate. Okay, Rio, Rio Co. Thank you for the super chat. Ask thoughts on the European scenario. Deutsche runs out of loans because cost to income greater than 100%. See negative interest creates deflationary recession followed by ECB inflation. I think that's a good possibility. I think that's a good possibility in the, in the United States as well. If you look at all the developed economies, the natural progression, if it wasn't for the central banks printing all this money and injecting all this artificial liquidity, it would be deflation because you've got so much debt in the system that when you go through the business cycle, that debt needs to inflate. So those are the two cross currents, that tug of war that's going on. Now, I don't want to get too technical, but the European situation is a little bit different because to my knowledge, at least the Bank of England, so the UK banks don't have reserve requirements. So they can do some things that are, I would go so far as say illegal, <laughs> definitely outside of the box to prop themselves up. And that's a whole other rabbit hole uh, that I'm not going to go down right now. But uh, I think if you're looking at this as a deflationary recession followed by some inflation because the central banks will come in and just print, 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 print. I think that's a, uh, that, that if you're, there's no certainties, but when you're looking at probabilities, I think that's that's the highest probable outcome right now. Karen asks, thank you, Karen, for the super chat. I own gold, thinking to get some savings, move to gold back debit card. Good idea. Which do you recommend? Well, first and foremost, Karen, I, I wouldn't, although I'm bullish on gold, I think it's a great insurance policy. I wouldn't do more than 10% of your investable portfolio in gold because although we may get inflation, gold can go to, who knows, 5,000, 10,000 an ounce, but that could be 10 years down the road. And you have all that capital tied up in an asset that's not paying you to own it. So I, I want to preface with that. Secondly, as far as a gold like debit card, I haven't researched those too much. I know that uh, Gold Money has one that I've heard is pretty good, but I haven't researched it enough to, to give you the thumbs up on it. So I, I would, if I'm just looking at an insurance policy, I'm looking at physical because that's, that's the safest bet. If you're looking at it as a speculation, then I wouldn't do physical, but I wouldn't do pure gold. I'd look at maybe the miners something like that. But again, make sure that it's it's not uh, more than five or 10% of the portfolio. Okay, Lala asks, thank you Lala for the super chat. I sleep on this channel. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you, Lala. Thank you for your service. Merry Christmas. I'm looking forward to your master class, speaking it into existence. Hmm. I haven't thought of doing a, a video like that as far as the mental side of investing or entrepreneurship, but especially in entrepreneurship, that is really, really crucial that you get the mindset right. So I think that may be a good topic for a future video 
after the holidays. Thank you very much and Merry Christmas to you as well. The Dallas Edwards, thank you for the super chat. Just says, thanks for the great work you do for all of us. Okay, no problem, I really enjoyed doing it. Okay, back to the chats. Scott asks, George, do you own any cryptocurrencies? I do not. I do not right now because I've got so much of my portfolio allocated to real estate. But when I sell one of my properties, uh, the the furthest, the furthest along project that I have right now in Medellin is about a month from completion. So as soon as I get that sold, I'm going to roll it over into more rental or into more properties, real estate projects. But I'll probably have more of the portfolio allocated to speculation, in which case I, I may consider that. Um, I kind of like the miners right now for speculation a little bit better, but uh as of right now, I don't. If I do, I'll definitely do a video on it. Okay. So, uh, Bollinger. Hi, Bollinger. Thanks for being in the comments all the time. I really appreciate that. Got a question. Unemployed versus not in labor force. Any thoughts on how U.S. tracks their fake stats? Again, to keep confidence up, 38% of working age people in the United States are not employed. And they set all time low. Well, that's a great point. I know that the unemployment numbers are cooked just like the inflation numbers. I don't know to what extent. I think shadow stats has a lot of info on that. But the, the main thing that you got to look at with the unemployment numbers is the labor force participation. So you can have 2% unemployment, but if the labor force participation is 50%, that, that's, that's, that's not good. So most people just look at that headline number and they don't look at labor force participation. To be fair, I think the labor force participation has been increasing lately. But I would start with looking at that so you get a true glimpse of unemployment. And then I go to shadow stats and look at some of the work that they do there to kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together. Okay, we got another super chat from Jesse James. Thank you, Jesse. Could you take a bit more time to talk about some honest mistakes you have made that you learned from that eventually helped you or could help us? <laughs> How long have you got, Jesse? <laughs> uh, we could go on all night about the mistakes I've made. I think first and foremost would be look would be buying an asset as an investment. And again, we've got to differentiate between an investment and a speculation. But buying an asset that doesn't pay you to own it. So I'll give you a specific example. I've got a lot of property right now in Ecuador, and it's a gorgeous coastline. It's the most popular coastline for building homes in all of Ecuador. It's like the Malibu of Ecuador. And I mean, the celebrities want to be there, the, the athletes, all that stuff. So it's very high demand. But Ecuador is only a country of maybe 15 million people. So you can have the best piece of property. And I've got oceanfront property right there, too. And you can, but it can take you three, four years to sell it. Doesn't necessarily mean that you got to lower your price. It's just there's no buyers. So I went in and bought that property a few years ago. I can't remember exactly what year. And I was going to build condominiums there, right on the ocean, looking out. And the project didn't go through for a variety of reasons. But now I've still got the property. It's an amazing piece of land, and there's the property taxes are almost non-existent, so there's not too many carrying costs. But that piece of property is tied up, and I probably got, boy, at least 150,000 in that property that's tied up, 150,000 US tied up in that property, where if I, if I would have bought an asset that would have paid me to own it, as an example, if I would have bought a house on the ocean or on that beachfront property, even if it wasn't very liquid, I could still rent that out and collect 
let's say two grand a month and while I'm just waiting to sell it. So if your worst case scenario is you're getting paid 8% or 10% per year to wait until you can sell it, until there's some more liquidity in the market, that's what you want. But instead, it's just sitting there dead weight and that money is not working for me. So that's probably, I could list a, a hundred other things I've done, but that that would is the first thing that uh, that comes to mind. And I, you know what, that's a great video. So I think what I'll do is, and Sebastian, I know you're listening. So please put that on the to-do list for next Friday to, to kind of put that into the queue. And what I'll do, Jesse, is uh, I will do a, an entire video on that because I think that's a, a really fantastic topic. Okay, Baxter, thanks for the super chat. Baxter asks, would you consider the best way to bet on a 2020 Trump landslide, not just victory, but an absolute landslide by supermajority. Mm, so I, I don't like doing that, Baxter. That's that's just not the way I invest personally. I, going back to my philosophy, first and foremost, just buy things when they're cheap, sell them when they're expensive. If you're looking at a strict investment, it's got to pay you to own it. Make sure you diversify, have some insurance with gold, diversify your political risk and currency risk. And that's just more of a gamble to me because I think that's already baked into the market. If I was going to do anything just as like a, like a side bet, and I hate to even suggest doing that, but if I was, if I was going to just do a side bet like that, I'd probably, what would I do? I'd probably short the market because the, I don't think anything's going to happen if, if uh, if Trump wins in a landslide, because that's already baked in the market, that's that's everyone is assuming that. So you want to take the opposite position. If you want to take a flyer, on, just like Trump winning in two thousand, um, whenever he won the the in two thousand sixteen. So because that you know you had Hillary Clinton with ninety nine percent odds. So if you're taking a bet that Trump is going to win, then there's a lot of upside and probably very little downside on that. And if if Trump loses, then I would assume that the market will really go down substantially. And so if I was going to take a side bet, that's what I'd do. But I, I wouldn't do it. I, I don't like side bets. It's just I don't like betting. I don't like gambling unless I have the odds in my favor. And then it's more just about investing. I mean, take if you're going to speculate, take the same money and speculate on something uh, that, that's cheap right now, like commodities or something like that. All right. Chadisms, thank you very much. Asked, what area in Kansas City should I, should I invest? Shawnee. Nah, I wouldn't go on the Kansas side, Chad, because the laws are more tenant friendly on the Kansas side, where the Missouri side, they're much more landlord friendly. And that's obviously what you want. So on the Missouri side, where I like to invest is Blue Springs and Lee Summit. There's a couple parts in, in Independence that are okay, but it's spotty. So if you're someone that doesn't know the area well, that's what I'd suggest. Again, uh, Lee Summit and Blue Springs. And just so you know, Chad, and for everyone listening, next weekend... Next Sunday, I've got a video coming out that I did with my with my personal real estate agent in uh, Missouri. She's in Blue Springs, where we go down by, almost like street by street of that entire area of where you want to look, what type of returns you can expect. And it's just a deep dive into buying a turnkey rental property or even going there and fixing one up to get some built-in equity in Missouri. So make sure you guys stay tuned for that. I think you're really going to love it. That's going to come out next Sunday. Hey, Scott, thanks for the super chat. So oh, thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. No question. So we'll move on to Mark Alexander asks, George, you have made me more money. Okay. That's, well, that's a good one. <laughs> I don't know how I've done that, but it's fantastic. It says, George, you have made me more money and will make me way more money than this donation. You rock. 
And well, thank you, Mark. I sincerely appreciate the kind, wor kind words. And if you've been able to capitalize on any of the videos, that's that's even better. That's that's really nice to hear. So the question: House hack a multifamily and cyclical market, or buy single family in linear market? That's a good question. Wow, question of the week right there. Let me think about that. You know, it depends, Mark. If you can get a a house hack like a triplex that that is cash flow positive the day you buy it, not cash flow positive based on a pro forma of rents increasing five percent per annum for the next five years, but if it's if it is if you can make it cash flow positive today, the day you buy it. And you can use a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. I would actually suggest house hacking because it's just such a good investment, especially for a young person, because not only is it cash flow positive, but that money that you would have spent on rent or a mortgage, you can invest that into something else every single month. So take that thousand or 1500 that you would have spent on your housing, you invest that. And at the end of 20 years, 30 years, you're going to have this huge portfolio of, of money or of uh, wealth, really, that you've gained from just those payments that would have gone to rent or to a mortgage. And then you've offloaded or you've kind of subbed out your mortgage payments to your tenants, not only the mortgage payment, but the taxes, the insurance, most of the maintenance. I mean, it's, it's just the best way to go. And then at the end of 30 years, you retire, you got a fourplex that's paying you every single month. You own it outright. You can leverage the equity to do some more real estate investing. It's just the, the best financial decision I think anybody can make. Tommy. <laughs> hey, Tommy, good to see you again on the chat. I really appreciate it. Okay, hopefully you're, you're not thinking about that stupid Corvette anymore. We got to talk you out of that, man. You got to you got to forget that. All right, Tommy asked, "Is it true you got your family an 8 by 10 autograph glossies for Christmas gifts?" <laughs> what do they think of your channel's success? Um let's well I mean my family is great. In fact, my sisters actually just let's see if we can Yeah, she's trying to hide right there. There she is. <laughs> but that's that's my sister. My family's great. They're very supportive. And any crazy idea that I have, and I've had some crazy ones, and they they really like the channel. They love the channel, in fact. And um, they're always telling me how they're watching my latest videos. So it, it's great. Now that I come back here to Dallas, I haven't seen my sister since I started the channel. We can just go back and forth. And she's a huge fan of macro voices and real vision and all that stuff. So that's, uh, that's all we talk about. We could just go on and on for hours. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really neat. And my mom's the same way. So she's flying in tomorrow. I'm sure she's going to have a lot to say about uh, interest rates or the fed or the real estate market as well. All right, John, thanks for the super chat asks, which country do you recommend for a second citizenship? Are you a citizen of Colombia? Can you elaborate on the potential tourist uh, or perpetual tourist scenario? Okay. Um, but let me ask, answer the easy question first. So I'm not a citizen of Colombia, but I just had Sebastian get a an investment visa for me. So I'm not sure whether it's three years or five years. Hopefully it's three years. Uh, I will be able to apply for dual citizenship. So citizenship in Colombia and in the United States. I'm doing that just as a plan B. If I just want to check out of the United States for a while, uh, you've always got that option. There, there's no downside to doing that. As far as countries that I'd recommend, I love Colombia, especially for the United States. Three hour flight from Miami, you're on East Coast time. It's um, Argentina is great. Uh, what else? 
else. And there's some places in Mexico that might be good if you want to be super close to the United States. If you like Europe, which I do, I suggest Croatia and Montenegro. Why? Because the weather's great. The cost of living is very low, just like Colombia, but not as low as Colombia, but, but close. The food's great. The people are great. And it's especially Montenegro, the whole entire country only has 600,000 people. So if you're looking at that as far as having a plan B scenario, if it kind of hits the fan in the developed world, you're so secluded there and isolated. And it's just a great like bug out plan, if you want to call it that. As far as the perpetual tourist, I really like that strategy as well, because if, if you're not spending more than six months in a specific country, you're not considered a tax resident. So now this doesn't really apply to U.S. people because we're, wherever we go, unfortunately, we got to pay U.S. taxes. But for Aussies or every other country in the, on the, in the world, in fact, other than one, there's one other country that's like the U.S. where it taxes its citizens, but it's just a little country in Africa. For the rest of the world, if you are a citizen of, let's say, the UK or, or Australia or Canada, if you go to Hong Kong, you will pay Hong Kong taxes. If you're a tax resident, you're not paying as uh, you're not paying Aussie taxes if you don't live there, even if you're Australian. So if the tax rate in Hong Kong is 10 percent, then you would be paying 10 percent on your income as long as it was sourced from Hong Kong or other areas. I think if it's still sourced in Australia, you've got to uh, still pay taxes. There. Now, again, I'm not an accountant, guys, so, so make sure you check with your CPA. I'm just giving you kind of broad stroke concepts. But my point is that if you are, let's say, a Canadian citizen and you're not taxed uh, on your citizenship but as, as your residency, then you can be a resident of, let's say, uh, let's say Hong Kong or Singapore where the taxes are very low and then you can just spend five months out of the year in Colombia, five months out of the year in Croatia, maybe a couple months out of the year in South Africa or, or Australia, somewhere else that's very pleasant, wherever you enjoy and you're, you're not a tax resident of any of those places. So you're still going back to paying taxes in Singapore, but that would be on only Singapore sourced income. So if you're like a digital nomad, then you can really kind of create this scenario where your taxes are, are almost non-existent. And again, to be clear, to be clear, that's only for people who are not U.S. citizens. That does not apply for U.S. citizens. The only place or the only strategy for U.S. citizens to get a tax break is to become a resident of Puerto Rico. For, and if you guys want to look that up, that's Act, they call it Act 20 and 22. And I'll probably do a video on that later. But if you guys want to check that out tonight, just Google it really quick and it'll it'll pop right up. That's what Peter Schiff has done, Simon Black, a, a lot of those guys. Okay, going back to the chats here. Let me go to the bottom one to see what you guys are. Oh, okay, it's like... Oh, shoot. Did this thing freeze? Hopefully this thing didn't freeze. Guys, can you hear me right now? Can you just, can you guys type in the chat? I don't know if my internet froze up here. Oh, yes. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Looked like the chat kind of froze up on me really quick. Okay. Question. All right, Supersonic asks, what advice would you give to someone starting from scratch with little to no debt and some income from a job? I'd go back to the house hacking, honestly. And there, there's, especially if you're like a first time home buyer, there's so many of these programs, these FHA programs or, or like military programs where you can go with like five, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but let's say five, 10% down where you don't have to have a lot of money. Now, I don't know if those apply to buying multifamily, to buying a, 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 a triplex or a, a fourplex, but do some homework. And who knows, it, I would start saving money 
And if you live in an area that's a, a linear market, you might be able to buy a triplex with 10 or 20 grand saved up. So that is what I would do for someone just starting out and who wanted to really start building wealth and, and do something that's going to pay them dividends in the future. Then again, you take that rent that you or that money that you would have spent on housing and start to invest that every single month. Okay, Xavier asks, non-balloon arm for bet on debt devaluation to gain multifamily commercial and real estate. Well, honestly, Xavier, I don't like an arm for anything. Uh, I mean, you never know what type of inflation we could get. And if you've got an arm, I, I know a lot of them cap out at a specific interest rate. I was speaking with someone on one of my consulting calls that had an adjustable rate mortgage, but uh, it capped out at 9%. So there, there are certain situations where like if you didn't owe much and you only had like two or three years of payments left that you'd want to go ahead and, and just pay it out. Because if you if you refi to a fixed rate with that, they're going to front load so much interest. It's not going to be financially beneficial, especially if you got a cap. But generally, you've just got to go with fixed rate mortgage. And I think I don't know this for sure, but I think you can still do a 30 year or at least a 15 year fixed rate for commercial. Okay. Any super, don't know super chats. Okay. Master asks, Master Administrator, is it possible for a Canadian expat who lives overseas, is it possible to get a 30-year fixed rate mortgage in the United States? I'm 90% I'm sure you can, but boy, I really, you know what, guys, let's do this. We'll do this. You guys see me do this in real time here. Jason Hartman, as you guys know from watching the channel, is is the super, super expert real estate investor. I mean, he is extremely well known. He's got the most popular real estate podcast out there. And I just happen to have him on speed dial. So let's do this. I've got him on, on uh, this little app right here. Let me just ask him and see if he responds. Jason, I'm on a live stream right now, and I've got a question from someone that I think you would answer a lot better or can answer a lot better than I can. They asked, is it possible for a Canadian expat to buy an income property and use 30-year fixed rate mortgage? So the bottom line is, is it possible for a Canadian to get a 30-year fixed rate mortgage in the US? Thanks, buddy. All right, we'll see what he says. <laughs> and that is what is so cool about technology and a live stream. Where are you gonna get that? You can just go right to the source, right to the man himself. Akmar asks, thanks for continuing to put yourself out there, George. No problem, thanks for watching the videos, guys. Looking at the Fed site, it seems they go into repo in 2017 for a few quarters. Is that so? And what was the reason? That's a great question. I am not sure. I know every once in a while they have repo spikes. I know they had one last January. That's one of the things that Zoltan Pozar was talking about as a report. I'd have to look into that. I have not looked into that specifically. So I know that they've never done it like this, where it's, it's whoops, okay, we'll do it for a day or two, and then all of a sudden it's 
basically permanent. But um, I'm not sure that's a great, great question. Dina asks, it seems like the Fed and PPT can keep this going forever with the algos. Okay, how long can this go on? It, Dina, it's just impossible to, to know. It's, it goes back to that saying that's so true that the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. Look at Japan, look at how long they've kept it going and kicking the can down the road. Japan, sooner or later, that's gonna end very, very badly. But they've been able to pull it off for 30 years. I don't think the US can pull it off that long because of the, the dynamics that are at play, such as the savings rate. The Japanese, as, as, a, as a group, have a 33.0% savings rate. That is crazy. Where in the United States, they say it's at six to eight, but I don't, if you look at the way they, they do the numbers, I, I don't think it's even close. I think it's probably around two or 3%. So why is that important? Because if you have a, a, a population that has a 30% savings rate, as opposed to a 3% savings rate, they can absorb a lot more of those bonds and they don't, or that government debt, and they don't have to rely on outside markets that could demand a much higher interest rate. So I'm gonna do a video on this very soon, but uh, I, I, I can't answer that. It, the, the, the timing, you just can't get it right. You can never get the timing right. You can only just say, okay, what do the fundamentals look like and what is going to play out? You know that, but as far as knowing when, that, that, that's impossible. Tommy asks, question. So the answer is oh. yes, but it's not going to be as desirable as what a U.S. citizen gets. Uh, they can get a 20 or 30 year fixed rate loan, mm -hmm. probably. Can you guys hear that? Um, a third, they have to go to um, a different marketplace, uh, you know, they can't do them through Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, which are the okay. really desirable loans. So we're talking higher interest rates, uh, less desirable terms. Sometimes they're, uh, you know, they become adjustable in five, seven or 10 years, but, but they have them that are fixed for the duration. Um, you know, that market changes, so don't quote me on that. Uh, but uh, the answer generally is yes. Uh, just note also that the interest rates are going to be, and I haven't checked them lately, uh, some of these you know private equity and hedge fund type lenders, but uh, probably about a point to a point and a half higher than the good, really you know artificially low subsidized Fannie Mae Freddie yeah. Mac loans. Hope that helps. Wow, cool, cool. So hopefully you guys could hear that. That was Jason. He just responded to me. And he said that it is possible. You're not going to get as good of an interest rate. He said maybe a point or two higher. And he said they have them, but they're not through Fannie and Freddie. So the bottom line is you're going to pay a little bit higher interest rate and they're a little harder to get, but it is possible. So cool. Technolo isn't technology awesome? Really, really cool. Okay, guys, the chat's moving pretty quick here. Let me, oh, there's one. Nathan asks, George, what cities in Colorado would be good for real estate investment? Hmm. Uh, yeah. I don't know if any would be very good, Nathan. I mean, I think... I don't know that market very well. I know Denver is overpriced and, and all the, the suburbs up south. I don't know about the Springs. Um, Boulder, I know, is ridiculous. But what you need to do is you just need to look at the RV ratios first and foremost. So that means how much gross rent are you getting per month relative to the price of the property? So if the property is $100,000, if you're 
looking for a 1% RV ratio, which you should be at a minimum 1%, that would pay $1,000 a month gross rent. So that's what you want to look for first and foremost. If you can find that, then okay, that market's most likely going to be pretty cheap. It, it's at least going to be worth exploring further. That's how I, I kind of look around in those smaller markets. You know, going down the highway towards Arizona or I'm sorry, New Mexico, there might be some towns in there that uh, that, that might the, the numbers might work, but I just don't know because I haven't looked into those markets specifically. But start with the RV ratio. And if you can try to find the income, the price to income ratio, that's where I'd start kind of building um, an idea of whether or not that market or that city, that area is worth pursuing. Let me go back to Sebastian here. Okay, Supersonic, thank you very much for the super chat. The thank you sticker, I, I appreciate it. And Carl, thank you very much for the super chat. Okay. Oh, no. this thing's moving around on me, guys. Sorry about that. Here's one. Crazy Legs asks, when these so-called euro dollars are created, does it strengthen or weaken the dollar? This is a like an hour long answer right here. It's such a great question. So these are dollars that are created outside of the US and the domestic economy by foreign banks lending to corporations, even countries. So if they are lending to entities that, are, are, that aren't using those dollars productively to where there's a greater supply chasing the same amount of goods and services, then it could create inflation because that's just a simple how much money supply is chasing the same amount of stuff at how high of a velocity but a lot of the euro dollars are kept within the financial system such as in derivatives so as we know and i think i went over a video of this last week with quantitative easing and why it doesn't always create hyperinflation because there's two economies remember there's the financial economy and the real economy and the the wall the line in the sand is the banking system so as the way it's set up right now now i think they're going to do helicopter money and mmt and a lot of different things to, to to get around that but right now no matter how much money the fed creates it can only get into the real economy it, not the only way but the main way it gets into the economy is that the banks do more lending but no matter how low you lower interest rates, if there's no demand for loans and people are tapped out, that, that liquidity is not going to go anywhere except, as we know, into the corporate bond market, into the into treasuries, into the stock market, into malinvestment, all of these things. So that's a great question, but it's impossible to know exactly what's going to happen, but those are the dynamics that are at play. Oh, no, there it is. Okay. Jeremy got your question. I just, it hopped around on me, but I, I stopped it. Will, 
okay. Will eventual collapse into anarchy once the dollar collapses? How long do you think it'll take for them to bring in a new currency? Boy. <laughs> the, uh, totally unknowable. I'm not going to pretend to have the answers for that. I think the only thing that you can do, Jeremy, if you think that is, well, first and foremost, you got to ask yourself, what are the probabilities of that happening? It's not a hundred percent. It's not zero percent. So, and that's, and I'm not going to say everyone has their own opinion on that. So you've got to start with that in mind, and then you've got to do homework, whether it's, channels like mine, or I'm sure there's several out there on YouTube that are, that are just as good and better. Then once you come to a conclusion for yourself as to what you think the probabilities are, then you can start to prepare for whatever outcome you think is, is most likely. That's an individual decision. I cannot answer that for you. And then whatever you think is the most likely outcome, that's how you want to prepare. There, there's no way you can guess the timing. You just have to have a plan B. So if things do play out the way you think, or, or if we go into a worst case scenario, then, then you've got it. You're, you're already dialed in. You don't have to worry about you, your family. You've already got things handled. So long story short, the best answer is to do probabilities, figure out what you think is, is the most likely outcome and get prepared and just don't really worry about the timing of it because it's just impossible to time. Question. Is Nashville and suburbs a good market for real estate now? Boy, it sure was. When I was really getting involved in rental properties and real estate when I retired in 2012. I know that market was really, really good. Now, I don't know because I haven't done a lot of homework because I'm so comfortable with Kansas City. But I do the same things. You just want to look. I mean, even go on Zillow. I know Zillow isn't perfect, but you can get a lot of information. Look at, you can see the sold listings and the and the for rent, and you just do some quick math to see what the RV ratios are. It doesn't take long, just a little 10, 15 minutes of homework, and you can determine whether or not it's a at least a market that's worth exploring. And if it is, then personally what I'd do is I'd go to Jason's website, it's jasonhartman.com, and see if he has any listings in Nashville. If he does, then you know that he that Jason and his team have kind of put their stamp of approval on it. One thing that you guys have to know about Jason is he doesn't just go into specific markets. His The markets where he does business are constantly changing based on which linear markets he thinks have the best opportunity at any given time. So I'd start with doing your own homework and then kind of maybe cross referencing it with, with, uh, with Jason's website. And just so you know, if you guys want to, he's got investment counselors that you can just email them and, uh, it's all free. You, you just go back and forth and ask your questions directly to them, but that's how I'd go about it personally. Okay. Super chat, Jesse. Thanks for being here, Jesse. I think I, I always see you in the comments in the live stream. So I really appreciate your support and your time. Asks, what's the probability the US goes into negative interest rates? Can you do a video on negative rates as the US is the last player to do this? Do consumers get negative rates or just banks? I've done at least one video on negative interest rates. Jesse, I might've done two, but go back in the videos, maybe three or four weeks. And I think there's at least one. I can't remember how deep I dive into negative rates, but if we look at Europe as an example, which I think we should, 
it, it doesn't go directly to the consumer. To your point, it's it's really affects the banks first and foremost. Then it goes to well, I think the way it played out in in Europe is it's gone from the banks to corporate debt. Believe it, I mean this. It's hard for me to even say this with with a straight face, but there's corporate debt right now in Europe that's trading with negative interest rates. I mean, it's it's tough to get your mind around that. So, but I think then, if I remember right, in I don't know if it was Sweden, it was one of the the Norwegian uh, excuse me Norwegian uh, areas where they do have consumer, I think I remember even a mortgage, like negative rate mortgage, but I, I don't know for sure. So banks, corporation, corporate debt, then the consumer, will it play out in the United States? It's it's not my base case, but it's, it's very close. I, I mean, I hate to throw out any numbers, but personally, I would give it a 30% chance, right right around there, a 30% chance of happening in the United States. That's negative. I, I don't know if we'd see it at the consumer level. That said, once the United States goes to a digital currency, which I don't think they're going to do any time in the near future, but I do think that that's inevitable then I would put the probability much higher, especially if they're trying to deal with inf uh, the lack of inflation or deal with what they perceive to be as potential deflation, then the, the negative interest rates are, who knows, five, six, seven, eight percent. I mean, it could just get crazy. You gotta remember, if you were to talk to any economist, 15 years ago, I mean, 10 years ago, and asked them about negative interest rates, they, they would have laughed in your face. They, they would have said, that is completely impossible. It will never happen. And they would have bet their life savings on it. Here we are, 10 years later, or however long it's been since, I guess Japan's had negative interest rates for a while, but... However long it's been, now we've got 17 trillion in negative yielding sovereign debt. You've got corporate debt in some areas, negative yielding. And, and I've read that story with a negative yielding mortgage. It's just completely insane. Hey, Wally, or Wa Wu Ali. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Thank you for the super chat. The money velocity is a historic lows. Yeah, velocity, yeah. Beside hoarding the bulk of newly created money, does quantitative easing suppress the velocity? It, in my opinion, it 100% does. The reason is because the Fed has these models which as we all know are extremely flawed. One of these models says that the lower interest rates go, the more people are gonna borrow and spend. I think this is nonsense and I think that it's, they've been proven wrong. It's, it's obvious that they've been proven wrong because if you're, someone who's retiring right now. Remember, we've got the baby boomers retiring, a huge glut of the population. And you have X amount set aside for your retirement. But you're thinking you're going to get a 5% return on your money. And that's how you've planned your life for the last 30 years. If all of a sudden that 5% that you thought you were going to get on your money goes down to 1% or 0%. Are you going to go out and borrow more and spend more? Absolutely not. You're going to save more. 
So that's going to actually decrease the velocity and it could actually decrease the money supply in the real economy as the Fed is increasing the money supply in the financial economy. So the takeaway is that yes, quantitative easing definitely can suppress the, the velocity. Scott asks, should I cash in my 401k or part of it even though I'll be penalized to reinvest the money? Will pension reform and inflation demolish 401ks? Well, I go back to part two of that interview I did with Jason because he outlines 401ks. And I, I'm, I'm not an expert on 401ks at all. I've never had one. So take this with a grain of salt. But he was talking about a self-directed 401k where you won't get penalized, but you can you can like sell out of stocks and maybe go into rental properties or or gold or something like that. That that our community and I'm I'm sure you kind of believe this as well, Scott would think is a little more prudent than being in the stock market when it's at all time highs, and and also. Why is it at all time highs? It has nothing to do with the fundamentals. It has 100% to do with liquidity. That's the reason the market is at all time highs. So do I want to have my money invested in something that is not only extremely expensive, but is only expensive due to artificial liquidity? For me, no way, no way. But I would start there, Scott. And um, I think that's the best advice that I can give you because I don't know much about the 401ks. Okay, guys, just looking for a question here. Okay, Steven asks, in the spirit of the season, any comments on things like Frankincense and myrrh. <laughs> uh, hmm. That used to be a good store of value, but obviously changed over the years. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point, Stephen. Good point. Could gold lose and Bitcoin gain? Sure, of course. Absolutely. But I just, I wouldn't put those in the same category. Because... Gold to me is insurance. And in your your example of the frankincense and myrrh is is perfect because it just shows you that gold, after 5,000 years of human history, is still a store of value and it still buys the same amount of stuff that it did a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, and all the other stores of value, uh, maybe not all of them, you know, of course, silver, but uh, none of the others or very few of them are around today. None of the currencies are. So I think that says everything that you need to know about gold right there. And Bitcoin is a speculation. It's just, it's in my opinion, it, I, I, I know a lot of people love Bitcoin and so do I. I, I love the, from a philosophical standpoint, I am I'm 100% on board with Bitcoin, but it's just too volatile and it doesn't have the history to be put in the category of an insurance policy. Okay. Oh. Boy, these questions are sorry guys i'm trying to get a question here a right, blueberries asks in a recent video you said you did not believe we would have hyperinflation but you had you'd also mentioned you believe gold oh, oh, would go to 100k uh, would that not result in hyperinflation okay well first of all guys what and i need to do a better job of this but a lot of times when i'm doing videos 
uh, like the Jim Rickards video. It, it's not that I'm saying I think gold will go to 100K. I'm saying that it could, and if it did, even if it's a 5% chance or 10% chance, this is how it could go there. It's not to say, I think this is going there. So I think I, I need to do a better job of, of communicating the, the difference between my personal beliefs or, or what I think is the most probable outcome and, and me explaining uh, how it could get there or someone else's opinion like records on how it could go to 10 or, or maybe 50,000. So let me make sure I'm at answering your question specifically. Oh, and I didn't believe we'd go into hyperinflation. I don't recall that. I, I might say that the, if you, def, if you define hyperinflation the way the IMF does, and I did a video on that outlining that all those studies that the IMF has done on the countries who have experienced hyperinflation in the last, I think it was 30 or 40 years. And that was an older video, but I would strongly suggest watching that one. It's uh, got the thumbnail of the dollar sign kind of like blowing away in the sand. And so if you define it the way they define it, the IMF, I would say that the probability is is definitely more than zero, but I wouldn't give it more than five or ten percent. But that's the way they define it. That doesn't mean that we couldn't get 30, 40, 50 percent infl inflation in the United States. Look at the 1970s. We got up to 10, 12, 15 percent, and that's the way it was measured. It could have been a lot higher than that. And think about that. We were at 10 or 15 percent in the 1970s and they had to go to carter bonds that think about how extreme that is so if we got up to 30 40 50 percent i mean my goodness that that would be that it would get very ugly so it all def depends on how you define hyperinflation Okay, I think we're caught up with Sebastian. Cool. Uh, Gregory asks, ever compared the graph of the Fed funds to the graph of the Dow gold? It looks like the same pattern, which to me would mean we've entered a 20 or 30 gold bull market. If you look at a starting point of 1970 or even 1980, I guess, to today, well, I guess it'd, it'd have to go back to when we left the gold standard. Yeah, if you, if you look at when we left the gold standard to today and adjust for inflation, I'm sure gold has, has really, really gone up. I don't know if it's gone up as much as the S&P or not. That would be a really interesting video. Also, another thing I'd look at, Gregory, is M2, which is the kind of the broad money supply. If you look at a chart of that and compare it with the Dow, the, I think you'll see the money supply has actually increased faster than the Dow. So that's worrisome as well. But listen it, it's it's still the same point and that's that the the market right now is just completely predicated on liquidity and artificial liquidity and that game just it, it can't go on forever it the, the stock market is completely detached from the economy it has nothing to do with the economy whatsoever Hey, Tom, oh, Tom, I had your question and it, it I think just, no, oh, no, shoot, I can't find it. Okay, moving on here. 
One Life asks, hello, George, please expand how the shadow banking is influencing what's going on in the real economy. That's, I'm trying to give you a good, really good answer on that. So shadow banking just, uh, I think the biggest risk of shadow banking is it's creating dollars that are outside of the purview of the Fed. It's, it's, they've got blinders on and they, they think that they completely control the money supply of dollars. And that is not true. So if they're assuming that let's just say there's $18 trillion in the system. We know from looking at Snyder's stuff and, and that it's at least double that, especially if you believe his opinion of the Euro dollar market being the actual reserve currency. So my point is that there's so many dollars that exist outside of the system or outside of, of what they know, that tunnel vision that they have. If we were to get inflation that really picks up, all those dollars come back, the, these, these hot potatoes that no one wants to hold on to because they, they're afraid that they're going to lose purchasing power. So how does that play out? We always say that the, the dollar can be a hot potato, but how, how does that actually work? Okay, so if you're someone that has a million dollars, US, let's say you live in Australia, wherever, and you see that the dollar went down last year or by 15% and is continuing to go down, and you see that the CPI, as the, the federal government measures it, goes up to like 10% and all you hear about in the media is inflation, inflation, inflation. What are you, what would you do? Right? You, you, you would, you would get rid of those dollars as fast as you possibly could. You'd exchange them for a local currency or you, if you wanted to keep dollar assets, you, you'd take that money straight back to the United States and you would buy let's say a piece of real estate because you wanted a hard asset that was an inflation hedge. That's what like the guys like Doug Casey that talk about this happening. That's what they're referring to. That's how it plays out in real life. So you can imagine the $20 trillion that's outside of the, the, the U S banking system rushing back in what that would do when, when you realize that inflation is all about the amount of money that's chasing the same goods and services, and then how fast that money is circulating. And if you've got all of this currency coming in from outside of the United States, obviously that's increasing the domestic money supply of dollars, but it's also increasing that velocity. So there, there is a, Situa there is a scenario that you can envision where even if we didn't get that helicopter money, even if, if the Fed couldn't figure out how to get around the, the banking system to get that liquidity from the financial market into the or from the excuse me, from the financial economy into the real economy. If if they stopped using the petrodollar as an example, whatever would create what, what are the catalyst would be to reduce the amount of demand for those dollars outside the US could have them flooding back in and creating a, a massive amount of inflation. And it would just totally blindside the Fed. They, they would have, it would just be like the housing crash. They, they would just never see it coming. Just never see it coming. Okay, here's a good question. P 
Pete, and I think Peter might be being a little sarcastic because I get accused of this all the time. <laughs> I think this might be kind of a backhanded uh, dig, but that's that's fine. That's fine. Question: What are your thoughts on perma bear doom and gloomers? I think you've got to compartmentalize people who, who are considered doom and gloomers. You've got a group of people who are just doing that to, to sell stuff, really. And then you've got other people who are doing that because they truly believe what they are seeing. And a lot of the, the quote unquote perma bears are, are people who really understand the economy. They, they see it, see, they are spot on. Now they'll get calls wrong and they won't be able to predict timing of certain things. And But as far as their analysis of the problem, I think it's spot on. So guys that I would put into that category, Jim Rogers, Peter Schiff, Mark Faber, these are guys that, and I know you can say, well, Peter talks his book with gold and everything. Yeah. I, I, okay. I, I can, that's a fair argument, but I just, after listening to Peter for since 2012 with his podcast, and if you look at his dad, I mean, you've got to look at what his father did. If you don't know who Peter Schiff's father was, Erwin Schiff, you've got to look at his backstory. That is not someone that just, kind of went with whatever whim he felt with felt like at the time to sold whatever um, thing that he could sell to make money. That is someone that had principle to a degree that I can't even comprehend. The guy went to prison knowingly that he was going to be there probably for the rest of his life just to prove a point out of sheer principle. How many people would be willing to do that? Very few. So that's the stock that, that Peter comes from. So I, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but I think Peter's an example of someone who's, who's, you know, in the last few years has got a lot of calls wrong and you could say, oh, he's just a permable. But if you look at his analysis of the, of the actual economy, it's spot on. Same thing with Rogers, same thing with, with, with Faber. In my opinion, everyone can say that I'm right, wrong. Everyone's entitled to opinion, but that's uh, that's what I think. Okay, Va Vajra asks if inflation is coming, then wouldn't it? then wouldn't taking out home equity to pay off things like student loans be a good idea? I don't think that's, I'm not going to say it's a bad idea. I don't think it's a great idea because you're not, you're not buying an asset that pays you to own it. You're, you're paying off a student, loan and I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but you can fix a, the, the rate on a student loan. I, I believe, I, I don't know, maybe you can't, but it, if you could fix the rate on a student loan, there's no way I'd pay it off with, with a home equity line of credit. I, I would take out a, 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 I'd refi to buy a property uh, a rental property that's going to give me positive cash flow where my renter is going to be paying my mortgage payment. You're deferring your, your mortgage payment and that interest and the property taxes to a renter. And then you're, you're getting paid to short the dollar by paying off a student loan, especially if you can keep it at a fixed rate. Yes. And I, I hate to even say this because this is, but I would keep paying the student loan as, at least till you see who wins the election. Because let's be honest, if you get a, a warrant in there or something, they, they may forgive the loan. And 
I, I would just keep make I would keep making the payments, see what happens at the election. But even if it didn't pan out, I would still take the the equity in my home, especially if I was in a big cyclical market, and I would take that into a linear market to 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 own that fixed rate mortgage that's going to pay me if we get some inflation that's above the interest rate that I'm paying on the loan. Oh, Yankee asks a good, let me try to stop this. Yankee Stacking asks a great question. Have you used private money lending, so hard money, in your real estate investments, OPM, other people's money? I have. And when I first started in real estate in 2012, I was listening to all the podcasts like Jason's and the real estate guys and Bigger Pockets, all that stuff. And I knew that that was a good way to boost your returns. At the time, I didn't need to use hard money. Uh, I had my, my savings from retiring, but uh, I gave it a shot because I wanted to understand really how it worked. So I think at the time I paid 10% and I did two flips in Kansas City with hard money. And they went okay. I, I didn't, uh, the thing that I didn't like is dealing with the, all the paperwork and the kind of reporting into the hard money guy. Like, like I had to give him updates on what we were doing. And as you guys can probably tell from my videos, I'm not real good with authority <laughs> and I don't really, I just, I just like doing things my own way. So I did it a couple of times. I think it's a great way to invest in real estate. If you know what you're doing, you got to know what you're doing and it's a great way to boost your returns. So I would, uh, I would look into it, but it just wasn't right for me. And by the way, that is one way that you can get leverage or use leverage in Colombia, in Medellin. It's, it would be impossible for a gringo to get a mortgage down there, but there is hard money and it's reasonable 12%. And the hard money here in the States that I paid was 10. So you figure 12 down there, that's not bad. Oh, here's a good question. Dark horse. A lot of real estate questions tonight, guys. That, that surprises me because the real estate videos don't get as many views. But uh, obviously, there's a lot of people watching. So that, that, that's great. That's great. I'm definitely going to keep doing the real estate videos, even though they're they're not very popular or they're not the most popular. He or he or she asks, I live in Japan where the housing market has been deflating for years. That's right. Very cautionary tale to those people in the United States that think that the real estate market will just go up forever. Could rental properties, could a rental property strategy work in this environment? Thank you. 100 percent. In fact, for sure, for sure, because if you can get a, a loan denominated in yen at a fixed rate, oh man, that would be a gift. Who I would, that would be a, that would be awesome. I don't know if they do thirty-year loans there. And for those of you watching who don't know this, the only reason that we have thirty-year loans in the United States is because they're subsidized that a 30 year loan, a 30 year mortgage, especially a fixed rate mortgage does not exist in a free market. So Fannie and Freddie have to prop up the market by buying that debt because the banks would never keep that loan on their books because it's a money loser. So I don't know if they have that product, that loan product in Japan. If they do, and if you can get a 1% RV ratio, which I have no clue because I haven't looked into that market, then yeah, I think it could be a fantastic strategy, but it, it's got to be in the right area. You've got to have meaning in, in an area that is most likely going to have high demand in the next 20 years. I'd go in a starter home and, and, and good RV ratios. And then I think it's, it, especially when you can get a, I don't even know what the mortgage rate in yen would be, but I'm guessing 2%, maybe 1.5%, maybe. 
Man, that would be great. Just think about that. In, in a, with all the debt that they have in Japan, at some time, that's got to, they've got to see inflation. And if you could lock in a 1.5% interest rate, wow, that would be great. Awesome question. Okay, sorry guys, the, I'm trying to stop the feed here. Okay, there I got one. Uh, Tom asks, how do you think that increasingly better trading bots will influence the stock market? So I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about algorithms. That's more of a trading question, Tom, and I'm, I'm not an expert on trading. I, I, I've, I've, the only thing I know is just through listening to podcasts like Macro Voices or watching specials on Real Vision. I haven't really studied it myself. And I know there's pros and cons with the algorithms. You know, they provide, I think, a lot of liquidity, but they are very, I think they increase maybe the volatility if we were to get into a situ situation that would normally have high vol because there, there's there's no discretionary decision-making. But uh, that's as far as I want to go because I, I don't want to, I'm not an expert there, so I, I don't want to uh, give you bad advice. Okay, so we got a super chat from ROI Co. Thank you very much. Asks, is gold confiscation a risk in your calculations? For sure. If you just look throughout history, the US did it, UK did it. I think it's definitely something that you have to think about. So that's, Another reason why my third rule in investing is to diversify your portfolio, but you've got to diversify your political risk. And I would have some of my gold on me or at my disposal in your backyard and in your safe, whatever. But then I'd also have a portion of it outside of your political jurisdiction. And this isn't just for Americans. This is for Aussies, Canadians. I don't care where you live. You, you've got to have some of that wealth outside of the government's control that you have to answer to. <laughs> I think that's the best way to put it. So maybe that's Singapore, storing some there. Maybe Perth. There's a lot of different options there, but that's how I would, that's how I'd plan for that to make sure that I've got some sort of hedge there in case you, you get a situation like that, which um, I, unfortunately they've done it in the past. So why won't they do it in the future? Okay, Sebastian, I've got Jan Carlo's question here, so you don't have to text that to me. So I'll just, oh, he did it anyway. Okay. Jan Carlos, thank you for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Do you think that if there isn't any positive news after February because Fed will stop repo operations, will trigger a panic or will negative earnings? Well, I think you're, if I'm reading your question right, Carlos, you're assuming that the Fed is going to stop repo in February. I don't see that happening. They, they may be, that may be their timeline right now if you go to the New York Fed's website, but they just keep increasing and increasing the timeline. And I think that this 
intervention, if you want to call it that, into the repo market is going to be just like QE. That, that once they start, they, they're never going to stop. They, they might take breaks, but eventually it, it's going to come back. And I think Snyder, Jeff Snyder, is right on the money when he says that the system is broken today, but it originally broke in 2008. When we went through the GFC, that's when the financial system broke, and it's been broken ever since. It's never fixed itself. So I, I don't think, I think they're going to keep doing it. So I don't think that will trigger a panic. And I don't know about negative earnings. I, I mean, it's just, there's so much liquidity in the system right now. I don't even think earnings matter because what if you get negative earnings? Well, then the market's going to assume that the Fed's going to inject more liquidity into the system. So it's, it's heads I win, tails you lose. <laughs> it just doesn't matter. They get good earnings and the stock market goes up because of good earnings. They get bad earnings and the stock market goes up because they think the Fed's going to inject more liquidity into the market to prop it up. It's just, it's, it's insane. So I think that's the best way that I can answer your question, Jan Carlos. Good question. And again, I appreciate the, the super chat. Okay. D asks, George, if you have an SBA loan in a commercial property, okay. Can, whoa. Can you refinance the loan? There is no prepayment penalty. And I am paying extra 12% or 10% every month. Is it worth it? How can you get my rate low? <laughs> I don't know if there's anything. I don't know if there's anything I could do for you, D. If I could, I'd wave the magic wand right now and make it happen. I don't, I've never had an SBA loan before. So I want to start with that. So the, anything I say here is just complete speculation. I would assume that if you use an SBA loan to buy a commercial property, that I don't know why you couldn't refi that because you're just paying off your existing lender with new money. And I, I don't see how that couldn't be legal or, or, or part of the agreement with the original SBA loan. The, my, then the next thing I would say is, is if you could get fixed rate debt, I don't know how long the term is on your SBA loan, but if you could get 30 year fixed rate mortgage on that, obviously I, I'd want you to refi with that. If you couldn't, if you could do 15, that's great. But it's, it's tough for me to say because I don't know the terms of your SBA loan. John Adams asks, do you speak Spanish or have, I think, or have to know the Colombian language, which is Spanish, to live there, or can you get by in English? No, 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 you get by in English easy, John. Super, super easy. I've been to over 40 countries, and I don't. I only speak English, and nowadays they've got so much technology. You, you just Google, just talk right into Google, and it translates right there for you. In Colombia, where I hang out the most, there are a lot of people speak English, but even if you didn't, the Spanish required to get by, which is basically restaurant Spanish, taxi Spanish, and hotel Spanish, you can learn in two weeks. It's really easy, especially if you're you're in that environment and you're 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 trying to speak it on a daily basis. You, you learn it very very fast. So that should not be a barrier for you going down there and, or at least going down there on vacation and seeing if you like it. So David asks, please, George, could you explain trickle up economics? 
as compared to trickle down economics. So let me try to think this through out loud. I'm assuming what you're saying is that the Fed, this the, the whole premise of trickle down economics is that you uh, you increase the level of the market. You incre basically you increase asset prices, and those who hold assets are going to spend more money. That's going to go into the economy, and they're going and that's going to boost the economy. Another way to look at it is you reduce taxes that increases the, the 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 amount of money or capital that entrepreneurs have to spend on growing their business that creates more jobs there's a lot of variables in there so taking the opposite of that approach which would be and i don't know if this is what you're saying david but i'm assuming you're saying like helicopter money so when you're taking and doing qe for the people let's call it that where or UBI, where you're putting a thousand dollars a month in every single American's pocket, and they're going out and spending that, and that's 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 creating demand from the bottom up. The, the the problem with that is that if you've got a regulatory environment where businesses, or especially if you got a Fed put, where the businesses that are getting that money aren't using that money in a way that's to increase productivity, then you're going to have more money chasing the same amount of goods and services. You're just going to get inflation. It's, it's not going to increase the purchasing power. And that that's the problem with, with the Keynesian approach to it's just all demand, 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 demand. We got to increase consumer demand. Well, that only works if the, if the stuff that's in the economy increases at the same rate. So I, I think that answers your question, or I, I hope that answers your question. But it's, a, it's an interesting way of looking at it, is trickle up instead of trickle down. I mean, here, Aaron, El, and El Souls says, so let me expand on this a little bit further because it looks like a couple more people are talking about it. The, the way that the money supply should increase in the economy, and if you want to do it through our, our existing banking system, through lending, lending isn't bad. Uh, I don't think fractional reserve banking in and of itself is bad or even whatever variation of fractional reserve banking we have right now, and that's debatable. But it, it, it creates an environment where people can, can use it for consumption as opposed to productivity. So if you've got loans going out into the economy that are being used for consumption only, it's just going to create inflation. If you've got debt that's being created, that's only going into the financial economy, the only thing it's going to do is create bubbles and boom bust cycles. But if you've got that same liquidity that's going out into the real economy, increasing the money supply to, and it's going to businesses, small businesses, mid-sized businesses, entrepreneurs that are creating more stuff and increasing productivity, then you're gonna have low inflation, you're gonna have very low uh, inequality, the, 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 the poor and the middle class, their standard of living is gonna raise just as fast as the, as the rich, and it's, it's just the, the, it's the best, how do I wanna say this? It's, it's the best, solution for an imperfect world and and so there's always going to be imperfections with capitalism as an example you can always point at flaws in capitalism and that's that's very true but it's the best system for an imperfect world dealing with imperfect human beings there is no utopia okay i'm at 150 I'm at a minute 30. Oh, 
You can tell my brain's fried. <laughs> uh, my brain is already on holiday, guys. Sorry. We're at an hour and 30 minutes. Just got a super chat, so let me answer this and a couple more questions, and um, we'll move on. I'll get to dinner, and uh, we'll get on to the holiday. Matthew asks, would you consider Charleston, South Carolina to be a linear market, a cyclical, moving there, looking to invest? So I'd say the same thing, Matt, as, as I've told a few people on the live stream today, just go to Zillow, do the homework, check out what the RV ratios are just in general, try to find some information on, on price to income. So what you could do is even if you've just got Zillow, just try to find what the average household income is in Charleston and then try to find what just by scanning Zillow, kind of what the average normal starter home or, or average mid-sized home is and then you can just pretty much do the math right there even if there's not official data on that and that's where i'd start and if the numbers look good the rv ratio the price to income ratio then i would go ahead and explore it further excuse me explore it explore it further all right <laughs> i need to get going here while I can still talk. All right, a couple more questions here. Okay. Akshay asks, hey, George, you inspired me to get into economics. Very cool, awesome. Your last video was technical regarding Zoltan. So my question is, what would you advise in learning economics and learning what you know? I learned everything I know from podcasts, audiobooks, YouTube, and Google. And just trying to, and then just trying to figure out how stuff works. I, I'm one of those people that, if you say, George, quantitative easing increases the money supply, I'm not just going to say, oh, okay, cool, great. I've got to know, okay, you're telling me it's increasing the money supply. I want to know why and how. So I, I'm always trying to figure stuff out. I'm always trying to figure out how things work. So if you've got kind of that type of personality, I think that you're going to learn as much as you need to learn with just a few audiobooks and some podcasts. So you want to start with macro voices. You want to look at Real Vision. If you've got the money to subscribe to their service, I'd strongly suggest it. If not, that's fine. They've got a lot of free content on their YouTube channel. As far as books, I would look at uh, Basic Economics by Thomas, Thomas Sowell. Mm -hmm. I'd read some of Roger's books. Uh, shifts books. He's got some really basic ones. I think one is how something about how an economy grows. Uh, oh, the uh, Tom Wood show. He's more of a libertarian, but he goes into a lot of the Austrian ideas. And then Contra Krugman is another great podcast that Tom Woods does with Bob Murphy, who's uh, a, a really smart guy in the Austrian space. And I just I just start there. I mean, even now, you guys have to realize that although I do those videos for the YouTube channel, even if I wasn't doing a video or a, a YouTube channel, that's all I do. <laughs> Seriously, that's all that is. I'm like addicted to it. So when I'm at the gym, it doesn't matter doing weights or on the treadmill. I'm listening to a, 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 you know, macro voices. If I'm even just walking down the street, if I'm walking to dinner, I'm, I'm listening to uh, the latest video from Real Vision, or I'm listening to a Market Wizards book, or yeah, I'm just it's just nonstop, nonstop. I've always got my headphones in. You know, the plane today. That's what I was doing. I was 
listening to podcasts and then I was doing research on how the modern banking system works uh, according to the Bank of England. They came out with a paper. I don't know how long it is. It's, it's maybe 10, 11 pages. And I was just diving into that, just trying to absorb as much as I could. That's just, but I'd be doing that even if I wasn't doing the videos. <laughs> that's just what I like doing. So that's, that's my best advice. Okay, we'll do one more. Yeah, we got up to speed on the super chats. See if I can focus my brain for, for one more question here. Okay, the question is, what are pros and cons of holding, I lost it, REITs versus physical real estate? REITs are a lot easier to buy, a lot more liquid. You don't have to manage them. I think those would be my, my top pros to, to REITs. The number one con is that you are not in control of the asset. So who knows what how they're paying themselves, the guy or the guys or gals that are managing the REIT. You can get an idea of what they're investing in, that's good, but I like being in control. And I I, I have more confidence in my own decision making process than anyone else. And also, I don't think that, I think that, uh, like Milton Friedman always said, no one is, every individual is going to manage their own money a lot better and with, with, and a lot more thoroughly and prudently than other people are going to manage their money, right? So, or OPM. If you've got a, if you've got a guy that's in charge of a fund and it, he's got no money in the fund and it's a billion dollar fund, but it's all these people that he's probably never met before, he's not going to be as careful with that money as he is with his own million dollars or hundred thousand dollars. I think that's the number one reason. And then number two is you're not going to be able to use 30 year fixed rate mortgage on that. So you're not going to be able to short the dollar. You're not going to be paid to short the dollar. I don't think it's a great inflation hedge. And then also going back to the cons, it's going to have a lot of market risk. So you could have a situation where the market, the stock market crashes like 1987. And that may take down REITs because they're in the market, so all boats rise and fall with the tide, but that rental property during that same time frame could do extremely well. It's a little more work for a rental property, but in, at the end of the day, I think it's, it's worth it. It's worth it. Okay, guys, thanks for being on the live stream. We had, I think, 500 500 plus that's fantastic it's amazing i i still am taken back by the the community and i just really want to wish each and every one of you a merry christmas a happy holiday oh and i also i want to go over a couple things here number one just to reiterate if you guys do want to book my time for an hour so i can answer your specific questions email sebastian at admin at georgegammon.com Number one. Number two is either next week or the week after, I'm going to be taking the audio from the Rebel Capitalist show, and we're going to be turning that into a podcast. And also, I'm going to be turning the audio from the live streams into a podcast as well. So the game plan right now is for the Rebel Capitalist show to um, go live as a podcast just the audio on Tuesdays and then on Thursdays we'll upload the just the audio from the live stream as a podcast. So we'll, we will have that 
within the next couple weeks. So stay tuned for that. And then the schedule for the holidays, we're not going to have a video tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, just so I can take some time off and enjoy my family. But we will start back up on Friday. So Friday, expect another video. Until that time, guys, enjoy your family. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. And we'll see you Friday.